I wanted to start uh, talking about an article that I read when I was very young. Um, this is an article that really had a kind of a serious impact on the way I thought about things later on. You know, sometimes these articles are very menial. I mean, something which for a lot of people wouldn't even touch them. And some articles just touch you and you never know why. And this is one of those articles. Just wanted a quick show of hands. How many people in this audience follow cricket or enjoy cricket? Just a quick show of hands. Oh, wow. That's not bad. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, something which happened. This article, really, which I read, was about something which happened way back, even for me. <laughs> okay? This was the 1948 tour of England by Australia. Okay? And most of you are, must have heard of Bradman. This was Bradman's last tour of England. And uh, as you know, in those days, people would play a lot of county matches before they get to the test. So the sixth county match was against Essex, one of the counties in England. And on that one day, the first day of the match, Australia scored 721 runs. And from what I know, it's still a record which has not been broken. Bradman scored a very, very quick century. And it seems it is, uh, you know, as per statistics, it was the fastest century he scored. And at 364 for two, in walks Keith Miller. Keith Miller was one of those big time all-rounders of the Australian team, much younger than Bradman. And by that time, he was already the person who had scored the highest, or was it the highest average in the tour so far. Just guess what happened? Anybody? He just walked in, took stands, the bowler came in bowl, he lifted the bat, and the ball hit the stumps. And he walked back to the pavilion. Okay? It became a big controversy because they said, how can he do this? I mean, so Miller just said, what is the big deal in plundering runs on an absolutely easy wicket? Anybody can do it. I don't need to do it. It's no fun. So let's just fast forward. Same series. Fourth test. England scored, England batted first, scored 496. Okay? And Australia started batting. We are in a bad position, 68 for three on the third day. Top three batsmen out, including Bradman. And England was really going in for the kill. Keith Miller and Neil Harvey, they got together. They just had one, you know how these guys have a mid-wicket conference? So these two batsmen got together and said, the only way we're going to turn it around is if you're going to go aggressive. So both decided that they're going to go aggressive. So Miller came back, took stance. Next ball, he hit it for a six. And both these guys really went hammer and tongs at the bowling. They scored about 121 runs between them in about 90 minutes. In those days of test cricket, that is like super fast. And the whole, you know, the language change, the way the thing worked changed from England being in a very, very dominant position, Australia suddenly became a dominant position. And they went on to take the innings lead, they went on to win the test. So here we are talking about a guy who in one match, Right? Decided to lift his bat and get out and out, out of the match. And the next, or a little while later, when it's a really tough going, when the pitch is really doing a lot, he stays on, takes the aggression to the other camp, and makes his team win. So just imagine, when I was young, when I read this, I said, wow, this is the guy I want to be. Right? Keith Miller is the guy. So the question really in my mind is, if you look at a startup, which match is it? Is it the Essex match or is it the fourth test match? 
So if you really want to, you know, look at the way you live, the way you do things, and if you really look at a startup, it resembles more a fourth test of this particular series than the SX match. SX match is easy weekend, which is not to say it's, I mean, anybody couldn't score. You still needed the skill. It's like playing in a large MNC with everything set up, all processes are done, right? Not easy, but not that difficult. Compared to this match, where things are really happening. The pitch is tough. You need the ability to face that kind of an uncertainty, face that kind of a music, right? And yet emerge victorious, right? So that's really what a startup is, I mean, in a nutshell, if you really look at it, that's really what a startup is all about. What are the things that would characterize a startup? Uncertainty. Nothing is a given, right? There is no surety how the ball is going to behave, right? One moment the ball could be bouncing off the pitch and zinging past your ear. The next you could be taking blows on your body, right? Are you in a position to do that? I mean, is, it, is that kind of uncertainty something that you can really tackle? Is it something that you really feel good about doing? Second is tough situations. It's like coming in when the top three batsmen are out and the opposition is really baying for your blood. Are you able to stand there, be comfortable, and really take it head on against the competition? In a typical startup, Tough situations will keep coming. For instance, just to give you a, an idea, in our first startup we did, which we started in 1999, December 2002, we were like days from closure. Money had run out completely. Okay, So we said, it's OK. We did our best. But we'll give it a last shot. And we managed to get a bridge funding, right? a bridge finance. We turned around, and from there on, we could kind of really build a completely new business, which we managed to sell three years down the road. So tough situations are part of the game. Whether you like it or not, it, they are going to come. right? And you should have the courage, and you should have the excitement, you should have the passion to be able to get over those. Other things which are typically there in a startup is there are no set processes and there is no stable infrastructure and support systems. So for a lot of, if you work in an MNC, a lot of things are given. Your cabin is given, your, your, there, there are people who are going to come and take care of your systems, systems will work all the time. A lot of things are given. In a startup, almost nothing is a given. Everything you do yourself, right? So let me put it this way. Is it all negative, therefore? Are there any positives? Let's look at it. I would say one of the big things, for me it's the biggest pleasure, this is almost little or no politics. And why? Any guesses? I'm sorry? The reality is, who has the time? <laughs> when there's a lion chasing you, you're running for your life, and everybody around you is also running for life, right? Who has the time to play politics, right? Just you are so involved and engrossed in what you do that there is no possibility of or energy to do anything else. So your entire energy is going towards what you need to do. The second for me, which is a huge plus, is there is a shared vision and something which generates significant positive energy. I mean, you, you really feel energy flowing through you all the time, right? And I've seen this, this is not just the founders, right? Down the line, you will see that the people who work for a startup also generate the same amount of energy and enthusiasm that the founder does. I mean, that's the only way a startup will work. And the third is, you can stop going to Disneyland, right? Because you are going to see so many highs and lows, free of cost, right? 
no problems at all <laughs> totally on the house so it's going to be an adrenaline rush like she was saying right your 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 life is going to be one hell of a high and a low and a few more this is something which i find very interesting in startups all the people not just the founders feel that what they do is going to make a difference to the company is going to make a difference to what say for instance i i do this many times i'm kind of driving back from a, from a meeting i get to talk to people who who work with me in my team and i generally ask them what what are you thinking i mean what 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 motivates you and it's amazing to me to see that the passion they share for what we want to achieve is the same as what i have and that really is so crucial because they believe that they're not just working for this company they own the company right that shared ownership is so crucial and the last thing in my view which is crucial is the fact that you're not handed down a set of things that you can do or you can't do you're free to do a lot of things you have you have freedom to think right so if you really look at it there are pros there are cons but just don't go by the fact that it sounds very romantic right because it's not something which is going to be an easy play so you better be what you better be a kit miller if you really want to make this work right the reason is if you don't uh imbibe that or if you don't naturally have that flair for it or naturally have the aptitude for it i think it's going to become very tough i've seen people who get burnt out very very quickly because for them the concept of so much of uncertainty the concept of so much of excitement the concept of so many highs and lows just doesn't work for them right they will just say my this is not for me <laughs> right so if you really believe that you're a kit miller then venture into a startup right whether it's a startup as a founder or startup as an employee it doesn't really matter because the whoever you are you're going to face the same music you're going to face the same set of pluses and the minuses the pros and the cons okay so just be clear that this is not something that's going to so how many kit millers are there in this crowd a quick show of hands okay <laughs> that's quite a few huh <laughs> so let me now say a few things which whatever i have said so far is very intuitive right let me say a few things which are not so intuitive or counter intuitive one of the things i found with a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, people who do startups come and talk to me to say what should i do should i do this should i do that one of the things i've realized is they don't necessarily set a very clear long term vision for themselves so when we started big basket one of the things we said is that we want to build the largest grocery retail company in india i'm not saying that's the only kind of a goal you should have friends so one of the goals that we are working towards now is to say in a one and a half to two year time front timeline we want to see if we can move all fruits and vegetables that we sell to an organic organically grown fruits and vegetables now that's fine what we want to really do is to see whether we can do all that we sell is organically grown and at the same price as a non organic that's a much tougher one to you know fight and get but we believe that if you do something which is a long term vision something which motivates people to really work towards a higher goal there's a higher probability that you will generate that energy to go and hit that kind of a goal line second thing which again flies in the face of what maybe even i said a little earlier is typically you say startup is chaos startup is no processes startup is do what you need to do every day as it, as the day starts not necessarily true sorry it just moved 
it is extremely critical to be process oriented. In fact, when we started the first two years, we just focused on building processes and building the technology to support those processes. If you don't have processes, you will just not get to the kind of scale that is required if you want to have a long-term vision. So it's very crucial that as an organization, be extremely nimble, be extremely fast-paced, be extremely open to new ideas, but don't throw away processes in the bargain. Then you're going to really get into trouble. The last thing is, whatever you do, do it really well. Execute really well. Because concept is fine. Sometimes startups come up with brilliant concepts. But when it comes to execution, they just don't deliver. And that becomes an issue. Because if you don't execute well, however good your concept is, however good your plans are, however good your thought process is, it's not going to work. It's not going to get you anywhere. If you keep these three mantras in mind, And let me tell you, whether you like it or not, you need hell of a lot of luck. <laughs> okay? I think you can really build an institution rather than just an organization. Okay? And let me say, there was, you must have heard of this startup which started towards the end of 70s and it's called Microsoft. <laughs> and then one more which started somewhere in the uh, 80s which is called Infosys. And one more which started towards the end of 90s called Google. <laughs> right? I think They've built an institution out of, an, out of a startup. Right? Therefore, the goal really has to be to go from a startup to an institution. At least that's the way you should set out your path. That's the way you have to move. And I think, in my view, if you look at the uncharted territories, one of the dreams that I have, something which I hope I still have the energy to do it after I finish whatever we need to do with Big Basket is to look at really water. Water as a single resource that is going to become the biggest conflict and the biggest issue for human beings per se. If somebody can really do a startup and figure out how to crack this problem, I think it will be an amazing institution to build. Thank you very much.